Hi, I'm Matt Tassaro, and I'm here with Cody Mafucci, and we're going to be talking about the final frontier, automating dynamic security testing. And I'm Matt Tassaro. I'm a core contributor to Defect Dojo. I'm also a co-lead of the OWASP AppSec Pipeline Project. I'm a distinguished engineer at uh, No Name Security, and I'm a, one of the founders of 10 Security. And my name is Cody Mafuki. I'm also an OWASP Defect Dojo core contributor. Uh, I work at Tipco Software as a senior security engineer, and I work with Matt at 10 Security as a product architect. And today's topic, so we're going to have a, a quick introduction to DAST automation, talk about some interesting challenges around it. Um, we're going to get, then spend some time talking about targeting DAST, which is actually a, a kind of an important area when you're trying to do automation. And then if we've uh, sacrificed enough chickens to the demo gods, we will have a successful live demo where we'll bring it all together and show you a working example of the different principles we've talked about in today's talk. Here's our intro to the DAST automation. Uh, so what is DAST really? Well, what does it mean for business and what does it even stand for? Uh, so DAST is an acronym, stands for Dynamic Application Security Testing. Um, and there's two major ways to really identify a security tool and determine what kind of tests it's going to be running on your application. Um, so you've got static, static analysis tools. They look at the application source code and they can do some sort of things like catching improper use of functions, potential sources of data corruption manipulation, and sometimes even the presence of credentials, of passwords and usernames. Um, and then you've got dynamic tools. They look at how the data is moving and it, it puts some safeguards around the movement and also test for validation before it even reaches the server. Um, and there's also some other flavors of, of DAS, such as like SCA, which is a source, nope, something analysis. <laughs> You've got RASP, IAST, pretty much any other type of AST with another letter in front of it. Um, but for this talk, we're really gonna be targeting um, dynamic testing. And so why is it hard to do auto, uh, DAS automation? Like, why did we even do this talk? Well, there's several things. Um, one of the things is just a common thing with any kind of DAS testing automation or not is companies hate testing in production, right? That's a bugaboo, it's a big scary thing, right? But that's, and that's fine, that's maybe that's your political reality, but then you have to deal with how well does the environment that you can test in actually match production, right? Does it have the same kind of controls around it? Does it have the same data, right? Is it, how close is it? Is there drift? And there's almost always drift. So there's some interesting considerations when you're doing that. And then another consideration, we'll, we'll cover this a little bit later when we talk about targeting as well, but then do you want to test with or without those security controls, right? Is it valuable to run an, a test, a DAS test without the WAF in place or with the WAF in place? And it kind of depends on your goals, to be quite honest. And then the other thing that can get you particularly with DAS automation is companies are just now starting to get a good grasp of sort of the DevOps uh, uh, configuration management thing, right? Where they might be using Chef, Puppet, Salt, Ansible, uh, Terraform, whatever your favorite flavor is, right? And they may be doing that. And if they are, and you have an elastic infrastructure, you're one step ahead. That's actually very, very handy for doing DAST automation. If you're not, maybe you might have containers. Containers are also super helpful. But if you do have uh, more elastic or the ability to deploy uh, an infrastructure or your application based on some kind of configuration management, this is when you go make friends with your DevOps teams and get a good working relationship because that can really move you forward in your automation efforts. And then finally, one of the things that people don't generally think about but can really be a problem is can you handle credentials in a dynamic and an automated fashion, right? Can I get the creds for the environment, say UAT that I'm testing in, on demand, right? Is there an API to do this? How do I get those? Do I have to like put in a ticket and have somebody work the ticket? And if I do get credentials, do they actually match the environment, right? There's a lot of wrinkles, particularly if you're doing a credentialed scan that you have to solve around credential management to make sure that you can get those in real time or at least in an automated fashion, right? And be able to log in and, and thoroughly test your application. So let's talk about the levels of testing. You know, you've got to kind of figure out what, what levels you want to test before you actually get, get your hands dirty and get to doing it. Um, so there's two major ways to really get out of the gate and there's authorized and unauthorized scanning. So unauthorized scans are, they're much simpler. They're, they're fast and they're really easy to sell to your boss, um, but it does drastically reduce your scope. You know, like you can really only cover maybe five to 10% of your application without having proper authorization. 
Um, and on the flip side, authorized scans take a lot more time from an engineer for planning, configuring, testing, integrating, the list goes on and on. Um, but it offers a much better and more valuable peek at the security of your application. Um, some other things to think about is, uh, how do you want to crawl the app? You know, there's, you could either crawl the entire thing at once, or you could target specific sections and break it into smaller chunks. Um, a full crawl is great. Uh, it makes sure that all of your bases are covered, um, but it does take a super large amount of time. You know, it's directly related to the size of your application, but at the end of the day, it's going to be a long time, especially if you're using commit-driven testing. You may have even some looping of your tests. But, you know, one, one may not finish before the next one starts. Um, and in contrast, you've got targeting crawling, but you, you could break this up and potentially even parallelize it. But at the end of the day, you're still going to have to consolidate all those reports back into a sane and easy to digestible report after the automation. So are you really saving that much time? Um, some, some things to really exclude from your crawling to save a little bit more time is things like a logout form. You know, handling sessions can be somewhat tricky in your configurations, especially if you're trying to test a, a very uh, in-depth RBAC system. Uh, another good thing is feedback forms. You know, your, your web dev team is going to really hate you if they find 300 feedback forms that they've got to process and they all have the same name and the same snippet of code and, and the feedback. Uh, it's just, why waste the time? Um, and another part is how much the website do you even really need to scan? You know, there could be some very static parts of the website that don't get touched very often and don't really need to be scanned every time a commit comes in or every time the pipeline is launched. Um, but what if you've got some some very complicated parts of your site? You know, they, these these uh, examples of such can be what if you've got part of your site that requires specific input to even become accessible? How can your crawler handle that? Is it, it can your crawler actually do that? Uh, and is this uh, maybe a lack on the tools crawler itself, or is your website just a little too complicated? Um, so thinking about how to handle those situations becomes a little tricky as well. Um, and some easy ways to handle that are using some browser automation to kind of walk through clicking through the page programmatically. Uh, examples are Python Selenium, Go's Rod. There's probably a, a, a good, good automation tool for every language. So we made this kind of handy chart here to sort of walk through some of your options in a more global way. Uh, so the easiest scan you can do is an unauthenticated scan, right? We have no creds. You don't have to worry about any of those kind of issues. So technically, this is super simple, right? Probably the simplest you could get. Now, unfortunately, the rigor could be very, very much less, like very little rigor at all. It'll be quick, mind you, because you're not testing much. But if your application only has a unauthenticated login page and the rest is behind auth, it's really not testing that much. Now, the, the third column here is important, although it's not a technical column, it's a political column. How easy is this to sell to your business if you want to do testing automation uh, on off in our particular case? Well, it's, it's pretty darn easy to sell because honestly, you could do this if you had a wild hair from a coffee shop, right? And no permission. I wouldn't recommend testing without permission. I wouldn't even suggest testing without permission, but you could do it, right? And somebody who didn't have your moral fortitude could do that for you, aka attacker. Right, so the political consideration is always important, and, and for the the unauthenticated, uh, even to prod is usually pretty easy because heck, anybody can do it today on the internet. So why not understand where you uh, where your app is at least from an unauth perspective? Then you go to the auth perspective. Right, this can be difficult to do right with all of the password management uh, problems I mentioned earlier. Right, can you get those dynamically? Do they actually match my environment? How how would, how does that whole credential manage? Mint work? Do you have multiple roles? Are you testing with multiple roles? And I need multiple creds. It just gets complicated quickly. Obviously, from a terms of perspective of rigor, this is a much more thorough test. Obviously, it's going to take longer, particularly if, like I said, all you have is a, a login page that's an off, and then the rest is behind there. This can be much harder, though, politically to sell, right? If you're doing this in prod, I could mess up prod, which nobody really wants. Right? If you're lucky, you might have a clonable prod where I could make what I would call a mini prod that I could test that doesn't really have customers using it, but it's more difficult and it's obviously a harder sell politically. And then the two sort of things about crawling, you could either have a full or a targeted crawl. Obviously a full crawl, it's built into most of the tools. You can have sometimes the crawlers in a tool get stuck in a loop where it re really goes into the shopping cart, it goes into the shopping cart and just gets stuck in maybe a workflow. You have to kind of watch out for that, make sure the crawl is sensible. Um, and the rigor of that is really only as good as a crawler that you're using for whatever tool. And the other thing that can hurt you with the full crawl is 
right? The crawl time. If you dynamically are creating a product page and you have 20,000 products, do you really need to crawl all 20,000 of those products? You probably don't, right? And then if you are in an application that is made up of several uh, teams work, right? It's sort of a composite of multiple web applications or APIs behind that web app, who owns the problem? If you find a problem three pages in, whose page is that, right? Is it a piece of that page? Because it's a microservice or is it the whole page? Like how does that ownership happen? That can be interesting at times. And then a targeted crawl, it's a little more difficult to set up. Ownership is usually easier because you can focus a targeted crawl just to those things that are owned by particular teams. Um, but then you have to figure out the, the crawl, right? You have to have some kind of browser automation, Selenium or something to do that targeted crawl so that you don't just let the, the, uh, the default crawler go on your tool. It's obviously easier to sell because you can tell the people explicitly where that app is going to go and what forms it'll fill out. And you can also focus on the most risky bits, right? If there's a one particular spooky part of your application, make that the target of your crawl. And you can uh, avoid having to like burn cycles for uh, portions of the app that aren't that important to the business. So there's a lot to consider here when actually getting into the, the technical bits of setting up your tool and integrating into your pipeline. Um, so Matt and I like to think of this as kind of like a three-phase system like the moon. You know, you've got your, your first stage, the, the, the crescent moon. This is the very hands-on and the learning sessions uh, to really determine what, what the tool is capable of. You know, do you even like the tool? Um, if it's successful, do you like the results that come out of it? You got to really become one with the tool here. And then step two is kind of like your half moon. Um, this is where the most tedious parts come in. This is where you're, you're fine tuning the configuration for performance needs, uh, reducing or increasing scope, and maybe even uh, messing with the quality of the results coming in. You know, can you make the, the results more verbose or less verbose? Um, and then finally, you, you're, you, you're at a point where you're ready to integrate the tool into your pipeline. And, you know, is it reliable? Can you, uh, can you run it, you know, 10 times per minute, or do you have to really think about the timing? You have to think about an, an appropriate cadence here. All right. And then the, the crescent moon phase, the first phase, as Cody mentioned, the whole point of this is to understand, is it worth moving forward, right? Can I give this thing enough of a test to understand that, yes, I want to invest some time in the future on this, and I'm going to get something from it, right? This is sometimes less about getting the perfect result and more about eliminating tools because they don't fit your situation. And, and why would you eliminate a tool? Well, it just doesn't work good against your target. You have a Angular front end and the tool you use doesn't like Angular for some reason. Well, chuck the tool to the curb, you don't need it, right? If you do run your tool against your application, can you get reasonable results, right? Are you happy with those results? Are they full of false positives? Can you filter out some false positives? How tunable is it? Right? This is where you get an idea of like, is this thing going to be uh, usable for me going forward? And then if you do have uh, success, right, you've sort of gone over all the hurdles that you need um, and you've decided, yes, I think this is worth going to the next step, then it's time to move on beyond this sort of successful proof of concept. So in stage two, this is after you've got your successful POC, as Matt mentioned, so you've got some more questions to ask yourself. You know, is the tool fast enough? Is it providing enough information, too much information? This, this is really the time to, to figure that out and see if you can really impact those, uh, those quantifiers through the configuration. Um, this process kind of continues until you've either reached the happy place in the configuration where you're ready to move on to the next step, or maybe you've run it enough times where you're starting to hate the tool a little bit. Um, but once you've reached that, that acceptable medium ground or maybe even your happy place, you want to run it a few more times and make sure it's repeatable. You know, a lot of unexpected external issues can crop up, especially if you're not really planning for them. You know, examples could be maybe a waffle isn't really as impeding on the way this the tool is running, and you know it doesn't actually report that it's broken. It just doesn't report anything at all. This is the time to really shake those out. Yeah, and then your final phase, the full moon, so to speak, right? You've got a solid profile. You're happy with it. You've tuned the scanner as much as you can and you're, you've, you've got reasonable in results that you're happy with, now it's time to automate this guy, truly automated. And I mean, automate it's launching, right? Um, if you're lucky, you'll have a tool that'll have a built-in scheduling option and your launching is just really deciding when you're gonna run this thing. But as you're thinking through when you're gonna run this thing, there's a couple cadence questions you sort of need to figure out, right? Do I wanna do this on what I would call a clock-based cadence, right? Is this every week, every month? 
every quarter or whatever your time cadence is that makes sense based on a calendar? Or do you want to do this more based on how you do releases, right? Is this a, a release or some kind of development environment, SDLC based? I merge in a master, right? We work in feature branches. And once we merge a feature branch into master, then I go do a test. Is it every release? Is it every commit? Right? You have a bunch of different hooks uh, you can basically uh, wire into during the development process to fire off these scans as well. And then once you've sort of sorted those out, it's now time, if you have it, ideally you do, um, to put that thing into CICD and understand um, like how you want those things to run. And then the final thing that can bite you, honestly, this is a bit of a word of warning, is if the new version of that tool comes out, particularly a major version, but almost, almost any minor version, honestly, you need to watch out for new signatures or new findings that may be correct or false that you may have to adjust by twiddling and doing some iteration on your profile again. And you may actually run into issues that just break your automation, right? That API you used to call the fire off the scan just went away in version three, like what happened, right? These things can bite you. So it's a little bit, you have to have a little bit of a, a pragmatic and sort of a forward looking as you're automating the tool, particularly when you're rolling out a new release. All right, so let's talk about targeting DAST. So I mentioned this earlier, this is the, the traditional bugaboo of any DAST scanning, right? Prod versus not prod and the hesitancy and the scary spookiness of testing prod. And then the conundrum that it leaves you with, right? This Gordian knot of fine, I can't test prod, but the thing I'm left testing UAT or pre-prod or testing or whatever you wanna call this environment, does it really match, right? And then if you want, if you've already determined scope in your automation and your scope is, I wanna know what our exposure is from the public internet, well, then it kind of has to be prod. Maybe it's an unauth scan of prod, but it kind of has to be prod. And this is where those scope decisions you've made earlier can drive requirements for where you test, right? If you are lucky enough to be in a place that does configuration management well, and you've got a rock and roll DevOps team, maybe they can create a mini prod for you, right? Maybe they have a, uh, a method to set up instead of your 50 horizontally scaled instances, maybe two or three, because that's plenty for your testing, they can set up this mini plot prod and you can go to town on it, right? Now the, the, the prod versus not prod is almost always a political argument, not a technical argument. So you may just have to get the best you or accept the best you can get out of the business in terms of its uh, ability to be comfortable with that. Um, but one thing you can do is if you do have any kind of observability or logging, or some kind of monitoring of your infrastructure, you can use that in wherever you're testing to argue for the safety of what your tests are, right? If you can run it against pre-prod that uh, hopefully mirrors prod and observability doesn't show CPU spikes or things going down or other issues, this is a good argument to say, you know what, let's upgrade ourselves and let's test prod. The other flip side of not testing prod is a lot of these staging UAT test environments, what have you, are the redheaded stepchildren of the infrastructure, right? They're not very well maintained and they're neglected. Or the other thing that can happen is if you have an application that's composed of a whole bunch of microservices, getting the versions of all of those microservices behind an API to match what you need to test can be very interesting, right? And do you have a version, sort of a meta version that represents particular versions of all the microservices behind those or all, all of those tracked separately? And I have version seven of microservice one, but version two of microservice two, but I actually need version six of microservice two. Uh, I need to like spin up a separate one. Oh my God, I'm going to go crazy. It's no fun. You want to jump off a bridge. So microservices can add some crazy complexity in terms of versioning and finding an environment that even matches what production is from a version of those services standpoint. Yeah, e echoing a lot of what Matt just talked about, it, we like to consider the the, the, the the excuse me the neglected environments. We like to call them static, and then the the ever changing and easily spin upable the dynamics. Um, so it, it's really determined on where you are on your infrastructure journey. You know, it's the, the questions to ask to really figure out where you are on that path. Is you know how are your services deployed? How are you managing configurations and secrets? Um, are, are they stored in a file or is there a secret vault? You know, are they easily accessible to the resources that you're running? Um, at the end of the day, passing values through a blue way environment is across the board, the easiest way to get the job done. And this really comes with elastic infrastructure, but it may not always be an option with where your organization, organization is on that automation journey. 
Um, so having a dynamic infrastructure such as like Kates or Docker Swarm is really the ideal here is they can achieve that the easiest. Um, so talking about traditional IT, you know, they, these sectors in an org usually have an environment for, you know, like dev, QA, UAT, pre-prod, halfway prod, almost their prod, and really anything else that you can imagine. Um, it, it's great to have a dedicated environment for that kind of thing that's isolated and you can do exactly what you're looking to do here, but that also introduces a lot of rigidity to your process. Um, the largest concern is, you know, how long can the parity between all of these systems be maintained? You know, it, the test confidence really starts to decline once, you know, your pre-prod starts to look nothing like your production or the things that you're testing in pre-prod don't necessarily make it to prod and that's just a waste of time. Um, so the ideal situation is to kind of shoot for something uh, that's called like a mini prod. It's essentially just a copy of prod that's much smaller. It's not as high availability and it's got a lot less resources, but it can be blown away totally. You know, if you just completely destroy it, there's no data loss, nobody gets hurt. You just, the worst case scenario is you have to start over and spin it up. And that's the only loss that you have. You know, everybody's happy there. And the biggest benefit is that it's it saves a lot of money too. Maintaining all of those traditional IT pre-prod pre -prod environments, just they sit there and they oftentimes don't get used as much as we'd hope. And that's just money down the drain. So blowing things out when you're done is nothing but benefits. And let's talk a little bit about losing control or maybe bringing control into scope, depending on your situation. And the whole idea here is beyond just the testing the web application, there's usually infrastructure between that app and the internet that may or may not be some kind of control points, be it a WAF, a load balancer, anti-bot, CDN, you name it, right? There's other things that can sort of sit in front of and influence the traffic to and from an app. And the big decision here is, do I care? Do I want to test? those controls as a, in scope of my testing or not, right? Do I wanna know what would happen if the application, suddenly all those secondary controls went away and the application was sort of an island in and of itself? How rugged would it be? Or do I wanna validate that, you know what, I've got this load balancer in place and if I ask too many times, it'll slow me down or QoS me or do whatever it needs to do, right? Those are both valid. Honestly, there's not a right answer here. It's really, what is the goal of your test? And so, you know, you could do a hybrid, you could do both, right? You could test with the controls and without the controls. There's a lot more setup and, and you know, wrangling to get that stuff done. But those are really important um, questions because you either get a really good picture of what the app does in isolation, i.e. if you only test the app and you forget the secondary controls, or you get a really good complete picture of what your total environment gives you, i.e. testing the app and all of those additional controls. So oh, to add a little extra information of the isolation versus the system testing, there's two major schools of, part of the bot. And this really boils down to not necessarily the, the WAF and the application, but either testing the entire application or maybe just a piece of it as a time. Um, so both have some, some pros and cons. So going over just a piece of the software first, you know, it, it's no doubt going to be easier to accomplish. You know, it, it, there's a lot less moving parts, a uh, lot less things to break. Uh, more often than not, the testing component will always have a single owner or, you know, a small team that you can just pass the results off to and they fix them and everything goes very swimmingly, you know, like it, it sounds like a win-win all the way around, but, you know, those don't really exist in security all that much. Um, so a big thing to really watch out for here is that these components almost always have dependencies. And so you may be hoping to really test one piece of the puzzle, but then you find out that one piece is connected to half of the rest of the puzzle. Um, so this doesn't always just come with, you know, I'm testing one piece and that's it. You're going to have to, it's going to be a kind of like an avalanche of testing, so to speak. Um, so you might be wondering, you know, why waste the time there? Let's just test the overall product. You know, like, yeah, it, it does give you a more realistic picture of, of what, where the pitfalls lie in your, your application, but there's always going to be a ton of corner case scenarios that are going to mess up your automation as well. Um, so in contrast to what we mentioned earlier, finding the correct team to pass the report on to after the testing becomes very difficult as well, because, you know, there could be a lot of overlap where maybe two teams work on the product because they're dependencies or, you know, things of that nature. But another difficulty to face here is something that Matt mentioned earlier is that versions may not necessarily line up here. So, you know, there's say 10, 10 different components to a given site via microservices. And, 
you know, that's 10 to the 10th of different combinations of versions that can all piece together to create so many different uh, possibilities to have either a very cohesive system that, you know, there's not a lot of vulnerabilities, not a lot of issues that could pop up, but then that one combination could just be completely disasterly. So you got to really watch out for the, the nasty change that could come up there. All right. And configuration management, right, which is hopefully your friend. Um, and the whole goal of configuration management beyond just its DevOps goal uh, for our test automation perspective is that it gives you reliable infrastructure that you can consistently and repeatably uh, uh, deploy, right? You can throw up whatever in the cloud and it looks like your prod, maybe it has a fewer uh, smaller VMs or less horizontal scaling, but it's, it's pretty, it is prod, right? Um, hopefully you have this available to you. If you don't start asking around, uh, ask around yesterday. Um, and then if you don't, it, it's not impossible. Like it's not the end of the world, but you, you're going to have to make some harder decisions about infrastructure. If you can make friends with the DevOps team and get them to put up a mini prod for you, like it's gangbusters, right? You don't have to worry about taking off, taking out production, adding bad data to some database somewhere, cleaning up after yourself. It's just blowing away those resources and you're done. So it does make life a lot better if you have that available to you. And then beyond just spinning up environments in a repeatable fashion and even better little mini prods for you, there's an additional benefit of going down this configuration management road in that you can bless certain versions of that configuration management. I've, I've done this before when I was at Rackspace where we had blessed versions of uh, configuration management to push out pieces of production. And we could tell the teams, I don't care if you push out one or 50 of those, as long as you use this blessed version, go knock yourself out, right? Which is enabling to those product teams, which is fantastic, right? And you can get mini prods out of it, which is always a good bonus. Let's talk Docker. You know, I, I'm convinced that Docker's are actually man's best friend. You know, like anyone can find joy in a container just as well as a dog can. And it, it's the emphasis on anybody here. Anybody can run a Docker container, whether you're doing it from a laptop, from a VM, even as daring as a Docker container inside of a Docker container. It can literally be done. Um, it's kind of crazy. Um, and they're they're great because they can be pulled from a registry for quick use or a developer can define a Docker file that consists of all the constructions to launch their application for easy testing. Um, but the best benefit of all is that it allows for fast testing in an environment that's almost always consistent, but it may not always be local to the developer that's trying to run it. A great example here is trying to get a Linux box on a Windows machine. You can't get the same you know, you can't get the same uh, behaviors of Linux shell within a PowerShell. It's just, it's never going to be the same. Um, but containers also offer a large ship left. You know, it, it provides developers a, a way to really test their applications all by themselves without ever having to integrate with the security team. You know, this is great for us security peeps. It creates less work for us. Um, they can really validate things on their own before committing and having to go through the uh, the frustration of, oh man, I failed this one uh, linting issue. I got to recommit and do all that again. They can do all that before even getting into the pipeline. Um, and then K8s are kind of like a, a natural evolution of Docker containers. You know, if you're already operational here and you're comfortable with K8s, then they're even better than Docker and they're highly available. Um, and it's super great for testing as well because you can essentially spin up a cluster of a given app and then hand out a pod to all the, the members of the security team to test against and play with. It's, it's pretty neat stuff. All right, and then we're now in our final section. We're gonna hopefully bring it all together for you. And Sempio, uh, I can't ever say that right. I made this slide, what was I thinking? But it is Italian for an example because Cody and I both have Italian backgrounds. So I figured it made sense. But anyway, here's our hypothetical uh, example that we're going to go through here. So you've decided you want to do some DAST automation. You decided you're going to take an easy, quick win by doing an unauthenticated scan. You're going to containerize the tools and the targets. So you have a nice middle ground. It's not quite K8s, but hey, it's it's a it's a easy to spin up and down infrastructure. You're going to run dynamic parallel deploys of the application um, of the, well, you're gonna run the application dynamically as well as parallelize the tools that are testing that application. You pick two tools to start with because let's start small and get some wins. So it's gonna be TLS testing and a DAS scanner. And then all those results when they're done will be shoved into your vulnerability repository, which if you're a good person and a smart person, it's Defect Dojo. I'll hand it over to Cody who's uh, gets full credit for the demo. 
favorite slide, Matt. Yeah, anytime I can get a picture of an astronaut uh, on the toilet, I mean, I'm all for it. It's just, uh, do your thing or get off the pot type of deal. Um, That's kind of where my head was at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I see we're running a little low on time here, so I'm not going to show the, the terminal of the browser. Um, but essentially what I'm doing is just running a quick script um, that spins up two Docker containers. Um, my prerequisites, as I'm calling it, that spin up a defect dojo. Here's an empty instance of it. And then our application is just juice up. Hopefully the application you're working on is a little more secure. Um, and then afterwards, I'm going to be running two different tests, one for Zap, you know, uh, praise to Zapcon. <laughs> and the second one, SSLIs, to make sure that all the TLS certs are valid and whatnot. Um, and as I'm running these, I'm, I'm waiting for the Zap scan to run. Um, but once it's done, uh, we're, all of the results are being kind of propagated into a single Docker volume. And then my data gathering and cleanup phase, take those reports, push them into Defect Dojo, and then get rid of all of the evidence that I was even here scanning stuff. Um, so as I'm waiting to this test to finish, I'm going to click through uh, kind of a graphical representation of what's happening. So this is the, the prerequisites, uh, the assumption before the pipeline starts. So I've got my vulnerability management of Defect Dojo and my application. Both are uh, housed in Docker containers just for quick testing. Uh, second, what's going to happen is Docker launches two containers, one for SSLIs and one for Zap. They, they do their scanning, drop it into the Docker volume, and the data cleanup. So uh, we want to remove the application because the pipeline is going to be done anyways. Um, and then I launched this super secret container that has all of the pipeline sauce. And it takes reports out of this volume and pushes them directly into Defect Dojo for processing. And finally, you want to get rid of that Docker volume. You know, you don't want those reports hanging around too long. Um, you can always make prettier ones for auditors or whatnot. And then remove the, the uh, processor once you're done there as well. So it looks like my script is over. So going back in the defect dojo, I've got some results propagated um, here inside of my juice shop application. Uh, just running through the findings real quick. Uh, I've got four from Zap and actually none from uh, SSLIs because I'm not running juice shop on, on TLS. So no surprises there. Um, I'll leave it up to Matt for the, the key takeaways. All right, so the, the key takeaways, the big thing here is target selection, right? Determining where you're going to test, if it's, if it's a static or a dynamic environment, is it going to be containers, is it going to be cloud, is it going to be Kubernetes, right? And then make sure you tear down those resources if you are dynamically setting them up because cloud providers love billing you for resources you're not using. It's kind of a thing. Um, and then once you've done your target selection, you want to connect this stuff to CI, CD, this is where you have those uh, contentions of timing, right? Do you want to have it just based on a calendar or a clock time or on a release time? Um, and then it's got to be okay, um, and it should be okay for you to have tests that run longer that maybe don't, if you're running a really fast release cycle several times a day, and you have a test that takes a day to run, fine. Like you just have several times that CI CD runs and the long running test doesn't, and that's okay. Right, And this is where you get into a breaking and a non-breaking test. So if you're doing your CI CD in a, in a proper fashion, you can have that long running test be non-breaking um, so that you can have the production code go out. If you're running that fast, like getting a fix out the door fast isn't gonna be a problem, so um, no big deal. The one catch though is you have to watch out for tests like we mentioned earlier that wrap on themselves. If you have a long running test, and you fire off a second long running test, it could be sort of like painting the bridge. By the time you get to the other end, you got to start repainting it. I mean, you don't want multiple versions of the same test happening at the same time. So you need some kind of flag or semaphore or something in place to allow CI CD to know, hey, that test is still running. Don't fire me up again. And be really clear about your scope, right? This is, an, this is something that doesn't seem like an important decision, but it really can change the parameters and the requirements of what you're doing for automation. So always be really clear about it. And I would suggest picking a small, easy scope to begin with, and then iterating and adding to it in the future, because you can get some nice, easy wins. You can sort of prove yourself to management if that's an issue for you, and then move forward and do greater, greater and better things. And then finally, and this should not be any surprise, do a lot of thinking about your scanner choice, right? Do you need a custom scanner that only does Angular? Or do you need a scanner that does anything? Do you have a lot of diversity in the apps you're um, scanning or not? Like, so maybe you need a general one. 
I love using open source scanners to begin with because guess what? They fly right underneath the budget radar. Um, a wasp zap, right, is a beautiful example of that. And then if you do have a commercial tool, there's several considerations like, is that commercial tool automation friendly? Um, I've had a commercial tool that told me they had an API for automation. And once we purchased it, I found out that API was a freaking Windows binary that I had to write some really awful Python to exec out and run, right? It was not what I would call automation friendly. So understand that particularly before you ink any deal. And how configurable is the tool and will the crawler crawl what your web apps are or look like, right? Because if you have a tool that can't crawl the style of app you've written, it's not much of a tool. And that's it. Thank you for watching. Awesome talk, Matt, Cody. Thank you so much for sharing your Zap knowledge and your Dask knowledge and all the really cool things you were talking about there. Uh, I know our Q&A session is going to be maybe a little short here, so we'll try to get uh, as much questions as we can from the comments and from the chat. Very first question is, at the end, the, our demo went really quick. Your demo went really quick. Um, is there a place where people can look at the setup that you had running for that demo to kind of walk through it and see what you were doing with Zap and Defect Dojo and all that stuff? There's nothing public right now, um, but we can certainly make that and provide it uh, well, somewhere, I guess, <laughs> uh, I to make it accessible we, to those that want yeah, it. We could put it in the Defect Dojo uh, GitHub org and just have a ZapCon repo. That'll work. ZapCon demo. That way people right, can yeah. find it after we, we push the code up. Sounds awesome. I, th I think that would be super appreciative for all the people that are watching today. And then when Discord comes back online or the rest of the internet stops breaking, can you post a, a link to that in your modern approaches to AppSec uh, channel in Discord? And that way people will be able to come back and reference this, the video, the recorded video and uh, stuff in the Discord. So that would be great. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe, the, that. maybe the most important question I saw in the chat was, Matt, how long does it take to do your hair? <laughs> hey, I got, I got uh, gel that goes to 11, so it doesn't take very long. Excellent. This one goes to 11, doesn't it? That's, yes. That's one more. Okay. Um, and, and seriously, the hair gel that I buy actually says it has like, it has 11 strength hold. And it's like somebody at that marketing place must have seen Spinal Tap. Sure. Um, Spinal Tap hair gel. I mean, why would you yep. not see that coming? Um, you guys talked about the three phases of the moon in your in your presentation here. Tell me about how you apply that when a dev team picks a new technology to write code in. Like they, they come up with something new. You've tailored your tooling and process for old stuff. They come up with something new. How do you tailor that back so that it works? Yeah, well, one of the reasons we have those three phases is you don't want to invest a lot of time with a tool, whatever it's doing, SAS, or anything, until you know what works with what code you're dealing with, right? And in the case of um, like, the, the devs team switching on you, this is where a really quick POC of just let's smell test our existing tool. If, if it flat doesn't work, then yeah, it's throw it away and move on to stage two. I mean, I, ideally you would know that that change was happening and you might could do that preemptively. Um, but a lot of times you just get blindsided by dev teams and that's, that's unfortunately life. Fair enough. Uh, the QA and prod discussion, uh, obviously a lot of like hesitation to scan and prod because don't bring the, don't bring the money maker down. Um, what you described as a data, like iterating the database with lots of different products. I call that the pants problem. Uh, we have many pairs of pants. It all gets served by a couple of different API routes probably. Um, and then also testing in QA and that not being the same as that prod environment. How do you guys, Think about balancing that pre-prod uh, testing and the lack of desire to test prod. And, and how do you focus your energy there so you get the most value out of it? Yeah, that's that's a that can be a really hard one. Uh, I was on the product secure, started the product security team at Rackspace, right? And we had loads of APIs and it was really hard to find environments because the cloud this team would want to push V2 while the cloud that team wanted to push V3 into QA, but now you don't know if one of those gets out the gate first, what you tested doesn't match where it's going to run, right? So like, 
we, we almost had to set up little mini QAs for all of the cloud product teams so they could control the version numbers on the matrix of things that made up our cloud. And the complexity, like Cody mentioned, just it skyrockets. It gets crazy. Um, the best thing to do is really just keep track of version numbers. And if luckily at Rack, we had a pretty good DevOps uh, group of people and we could get mini environments set up without too much hassle. If you don't have that, then it, it really comes down to understanding your scope and explaining to the business the compromises you have to make in terms of test coverage. Like I can't give you full assurance, right? That I've tested all of the, the combinations that exist in prod because this doesn't match. Now, maybe it's only one off service that doesn't provide a lot of value to the business and you're, you know, maybe management is okay with that, but maybe not, but at least you have to have that conversation to sort of set expectations. Like I cannot guarantee this is 100% good testing because the environments just don't match. So you, so would you say having that relationship with product teams and engineering teams is just as important as having good tooling and catering that tooling for software they're building, also catering what you're doing for the teams you're testing for? Oh, 100%. Uh, oh, my. <laughs> like the other, the other, like besides product teams and management, it's good in the DevOps uh, teams. It's really good to be friendly with the QA people. I can't tell you how many times I was able to, to get things working because the QA was a more established group and they had a little more pull. And so I could kind of piggyback on their efforts, right? Hey, they're spinning us up an environment for some QA functional testing, like sweet. Don't mind if I step in, do you, and do a little security on the side. And they, most of the time they're fine with it, right? If, if, you, if you play nice with people, <laughs> right? It's not so bad. Cody, I think you were going to say something there too. Yeah, just kind of echoing it. It's kind of essential to have a happy ship no matter what you're doing or where you're going. So if you just try to be nice to everybody and just generally just be a good person to everybody and not pull on too many toes, then everyone will be happy and do lots of favors for you and in return. You know, everyone makes each other look good nice. in an ideal world. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. Build a build a strong security program that is not the department of no, but more of a a, a better improv partner with the development product teams. Yeah, I like the, the paved road with guardrails kind of idea, right? Like, and we did a lot of that in the past in other app set groups where you just, you know, you give people the parameters with which they can work in. And as long as they meet those parameters, do whatever you need to do. Like, don't let me get in your way. Awesome. You guys, I, that's that's all the time we have for Q&A. Um, Discord looks like it's coming back to life for everyone. So if you're out in Discord, the Final Frontier Automating Dast channel, give Matt and Cody a big thank you. Uh, clappy thumbs up, Zapbot emoji out there. Thank you guys for putting time into the presentation, recording the presentation, and joining us for live Q&A. The uh, Discord and the internet had different different plans for us today, but you know we made do. Uh, so thank you guys so much for, for joining us today. Thanks Happy for to be here. Stuff.